This video is brought to you by Blessed Be God Boutique, maker of Catholic fashionable apparel, handmade accessories, and more. Today's video was originally going to be about a memo that is circulating in the Roman Curia among the cardinals of the College of Cardinals, those responsible for choosing the man who will be the next pope. That memo is reminding them about the stakes of the coming conclave. I'm still going to cover that today, but you're probably aware by now that Francis sent shockwaves through the entire Catholic world yesterday when he said he was going to honor the requests of some of the bishops in the conflict zone to honor the request of Our Lady of Fatima and do the consecration that she requested. Many Catholics are hopeful at this news, and I hate to be the one to break this to you, but it's probably not going to work. Francis is not going to follow the rather simple instructions given by heaven. The consecration of one specific country in union with all the bishops of the world to be carried out by the Pope. There's no mention of requiring the bishops of the Catholic Church to join him in this consecration, according to the reporting out of Rome, and he's going to be naming more than the country requested by heaven. And I wouldn't care that much about naming additional countries if he had all the bishops of the world participating and named the country specifically. But as it stands now, he's not going to do that. And because he isn't being obedient to heaven in this simple, most simple of requests, that consecration is probably not going to work. But instead of debating all this, we can all do something. Contact your bishop. Whether he's Archbishop Sample of Portland or Cardinal Supich of Chicago or anyone in between, Demand that they request that Francis include all the bishops of the world in his action. Call your bishop. Send him a letter. Email them. It doesn't matter. They will notice if they start getting a lot of phone calls and letters and things to do this. And remember this. All of the debates that people have had about this, including whether it's Francis or Benedict who needs to do this, it's all kind of moot because if what he does works on March 25th, the Feast of the Annunciation, we will all know because the promises of Fatima make it abundantly clear. The whole world is going to know. The whole world will convert. Heresies will be destroyed. Schisms ended and an age of peace will begin. It won't be a simple matter of a conflict ending. It'll be so miraculous that the whole world will acknowledge Christ the King. That is part of the Fatima message. So if that doesn't happen immediately upon the consecration being done by Francis, then you'll have your answer. So write to your bishops, pray and offer Lenten penances for this to be done per heaven's instructions. If you want inf more information on this, first, Dr. Taylor Marshall had a video on this when the news broke, which he typically does, and he goes in pretty in-depth, given how long his videos typically are. Second, I will almost certainly do a video on the promises made by heaven connected to Fatima. And that'll be in the next few days, I think. They, there were certain promises made about what would happen if a consecration was done as heaven requested. It will be undeniable. As for Francis having to do it the right way, some say that it's legalism to make that claim. I don't think so. A listener reminded me on Twitter of the story of Abraham from the Old Testament and how he was denied the promised land. He was given simple instructions to hit a specific rock in a specific way. He didn't follow orders. He embellished things a little bit. He did more than what was asked of him and was denied entry into the promised land. If you read the Old Testament, you're going to find stories like that sprinkled throughout. When God gives instructions, he expects them to be followed to the letter. It's not legalism. It's just doing what we're told to do. It's simple obedience. And on that note, I have to ask, have you kept the five first Saturdays devotion? Most Catholics haven't. Hardly any Catholics have kept the five first Saturdays devotion, which was also requested at Fatima. It's food for thought. Obedience on this to the Fatima message has been lacking for over 70 years now, coming right from the top of the church. Every pope has failed to do it. It's time for them to get it right. We'll know in a few days. Enough of that story, though. On to the bizarre story out of Rome. A memo has been circulating around Rome lately, written by a member of the Roman Curia, and sent to the College of Cardinals, who are the ones responsible for choosing who the next pope is going to be. This memo is circulating at a time when rumors are again swirling that Francis is short of time left on this earth. A rumor that comes up so often now that I don't usually bother reporting on it anymore, because it's probably just rumors fed out of Rome just to see what kind of reaction they're going to get. But the memo has turned some heads, so today I'll have that memo for you in full, and some thoughts of my own at the end. 
here's a hint about what I think about this. I'm honestly pretty skeptical of this memo, since it reads to me like it was written by someone who wants to be Pope themselves. Perhaps the political scientist in me is just reading too much into this, and maybe I'm wrong about that. I'll let you decide. But here's that document. It does a good job of laying out the problems in the church today, at least on the more superficial level, because it never addresses modernism in any real way. So these are mostly the problems of the Francis pontificate. The alleged memorandum that is circulating, or said to be circulating, among the Roman cardinals regarding the coming conclave. The Vatican Today Commentators of every school, if for different reasons, with the possible exception of Father Spadaro, S.J., agree that this pontificate is a disaster in many or most respects, a catastrophe. 1. The successor of St. Peter is the rock on which the Church is built, a major source and cause of worldwide unity. Historically, St. Irenaeus, the Pope, and the Church of Rome have a unique role in preserving the apostolic tradition, the rule of faith, in ensuring that the churches continue to teach what Christ and the Apostles taught. Previously it was Roma locuta causa finita est. Today it is Roma locutor confusa agitur. The German Synod speaks on the James Martin topic, women priests, communion for the divorced. The papacy is silent. Cardinal Hollerich rejects the Christian teaching on these things. The papacy is silent. This is doubly significant because the cardinal is explicitly heretical. He does not use code or hints. If the cardinal were to continue without Roman correction, this would represent another deeper breakdown of discipline with few or any precedents in history. The congregation for the doctrine of the faith must act and speak. The silence is emphasized when contrasted with the active persecution of the traditionalists and the contemplative convents. 2. The Christocentric city of teaching is being weakened. Christ is being moved from the center. Sometimes Rome even seems to be confused about the importance of a strict monotheism, hinting at some wider concept of divinity, but like an Eastern pantheistic type. Pacamam is idolatrous. Perhaps it was not intended as such initially. The contemplative nuns are being persecuted and attempts are being made to change the teachings of the charismatics. The Christocentric legacy of St. John Paul II in faith and morals is under systematic attack. Many of the staff of the Roman Institute for the Family have been dismissed. Most students have left. The Academy for Life is gravely damaged. E.g., some members recently supported an assisted way of removing oneself. The Pontifical Academies have members and visiting speakers who support the Moloch procedure. 3. The lack of respect for the law in the Vatican risks becoming an international scandal. These issues have been crystallized through the present Vatican trial of 10 accused of financial malpractices, but the problem is older and wider. The Pope has changed the law four times during the trial to help with the prosecution. Cardinal Becciu has not been treated by it justly because he was removed from his position and stripped of his cardinalatial dignities without any trial. He did not receive due process. Everyone has a right to due process. As the Pope is the head of the Vatican State and the source of all legal authority, he has used his power to intervene in legal procedures. The Pope sometimes often rules by papal decrees, modo proprio, which eliminate the right to appeal of those affected. Many staff, often priests, have been summarily dismissed from the Vatican Curia, often without good reason. Phone tapping is regularly practiced. I am not sure how often it is authorized. In the English case against Torzi, the judge criticized the Vatican prosecutors harshly, they are either incompetent and or were nobbled, prevented from giving the full picture. The raid by the Vatican Gendarmeria, led by Dr. Gianni in 2017 on the auditor's office on Italian territory, was probably illegal and certainly intimidating and violent. It is possible that evidence against Malone was fabricated. 4. The financial situation of the Vatican is grave. For the past 10 years, at least, there has nearly always been financial deficits. Before the situation that controlled the world in 2020, these deficits ranged around 20 million euros annually. For the last three years, they have been around 30 to 35 million annually. The problems predate both Pope Francis and Pope Benedict. The Vatican is facing a large deficit in the pensions fund. Around 2014, the experts from Sosea estimated the deficit would be around 800 million euros in 2030. This was before that previously mentioned situation from 2020. 
It is estimated that the Vatican has lost 217 million euros on the Sloan Avenue property in London. In the 1980s, the Vatican was forced to pay out 230 million after the Banco Ambrosiano scandal. Through the inefficiency and corruption during the 25 to 30 years, the Vatican has lost at least another 100 million euros, and it probably would be much higher, perhaps 150 to 200 million. Despite the Holy Father's recent decision, the process of investing has not been centralized. As recommended by Sosea in 2014 and attempted by the Secretariat for the Economy in 2015 to 16, and remains immune to expert advice. For decades, the Vatican has dealt with disreputable financiers, avoided by all respectable bankers in Italy. The return of the 5261 Vatican properties remains scandalously low. In 2019, the return, before that situation, was nearly $4,500 a year. In 2020, it was 2,900 euros a property. The changing role of Pope Francis in the financial reforms, incomplete but substantial progress as far as reducing crime is concerned, much less successful except at IOR in terms of profitability, is a mystery and an enigma. Initially, the Holy Father strongly backed the reforms. He then prevented the centralization of investments, opposed the reforms and most attempts to unveil corruption, and supported then Archbishop Becciu at the center of Vatican financial establishment. Then in 2020, the Pope turned on Becciu and eventually 10 persons were placed on trial and charged. Over the years, few prosecutions were attempted from AIF reports of infringement. The external auditors Price Waterhouse and Cooper were dismissed, and the Auditor General Libero Malone was forced to resign on trumped-up charges in 2017. They were coming too close to the corruption in the Secretariat of State. The political influence of Pope Francis in the Vatican is negligible. Intellectually, papal writings demonstrate a decline from the standard of St. John Paul II and Pope Benedict. Decisions and policies are often politically correct, but there have been grave failures to support human rights in Venezuela, Hong Kong, the Middle Kingdom, and now in the present international situation. There has been no public support for the loyal Catholics in the Middle Kingdom who have been intermittently persecuted for their loyalty to the papacy for more than 70 years. No public Vatican support for the Catholic community in the present international situation, especially the Greek Catholics. These issues should be revisited by the next Pope. The Vatican's political prestige is now at a low ebb. At a different lower level, the situation of Tridentine traditionalists, Catholics, should be regularized. At a further and lower level, the celebration of individual and small group masses in the mornings in St. Peter's Basilica should be permitted once again. At the moment, this great basilica is like a desert in the early morning. The 2020-2022 crisis has covered up the large decline in the number of pilgrims attending papal audiences and masses. The Holy Father has little support among seminarians and young priests, and widespread disaffiliation exists in the Vatican Curia. The Next Conclave Point 1. The College of Cardinals has been weakened by eccentric nominations and has not been re reconvened after the rejection of Cardinal Casper's views in the 2014 consistory. Many cardinals are unknown to one another, adding a new dimension of unpredictability to the next conclave. 2. After Vatican II, Catholic authorities often underestimated the hostile power of secularization, the world, the flesh, and the devil, especially in the Western world, and overestimated the influence and strength of the Catholic Church. We are weaker than 50 years ago, and many factors are beyond our control, in the short term at least, including the decline in the number of believers, the frequency of mass attendance, the demise or extinction of many religious orders. Point 3. The Pope does not need to be the world's best evangelist nor a political force. The successor of Peter as head of the College of Bishops, also successors of the Apostles, has a foundational role for unity and doctrine. The new Pope must understand that the secret of Christian and Catholic vitality comes from the fidelity to the teachings of Christ and Catholic practices. It does not come from adapting to the world or from money. 4. The first task of the new pope will be to restore normality, restore doctrinal clarity and faith and morals, restore a proper respect for the law, and ensure that the first criterion for the nomination of bishops is acceptance of the apostolic tradition. Theological expertise and learning are an advantage, not a hindrance for all bishops, and especially archbishops. These are necessary foundations for living and preaching the gospel. 5. If the synodal gatherings continue around the world, they will consume much time and money, probably distracting energy from evangelization and service rather than deepening these essential activities. If the national or continental synods are given doctrinal authority, we will have a new danger to worldwide church unity, whereby, for example, the German church holds doctrinal views not shared by other churches and not compatible with the apostolic tradition. 
If there was no Roman correction of such heresy, the church would be reduced to a loose federation of local churches holding different views, probably closer to an Anglican or Protestant model than an Orthodox model. An early priority for the next pope must be to remove and prevent such a threatening development by requiring unity in essentials and not permitting unacceptable doctrinal differences. The morality of James Martin activity will be one such flashpoint. 6. While the younger clergy and seminarians are almost completely orthodox, sometimes quite conservative, the new pope will need to be aware of the substantial changes affected on the church's leadership since 2013, perhaps especially in South and Central America. There is a new spring in the step of the Protestant liberals in the Catholic Church. Schism is not likely to occur from the left, who often sit lightly to doctrinal issues. Schism is more likely to come from the right, and is always possible when liturgical tensions are inflamed and not dampened. Unity in the essentials, diversity in the non-essentials, charity on all issues. 7. Despite the dangerous decline in the West and the inherent fragility and instability in many places, serious consideration should be given to the feasibility of a visitation on the Jesuit order. They are in a situation of catastrophic numerical decline from 36,000 members during the council to less than 16,000 in 2017, with probably 20 to 25 percent above 75 years of age. In some places, there is catastrophic moral decline. The order is highly centralized, susceptible to reform or damage from the top. The Jesuit charism and contribution have been and are so important to the church that they should not be allowed to pass away into history undisturbed or become simply an Asian African community. 8. The disastrous decline in Catholic numbers and Protestant expansion in South America should be addressed. It was scarcely mentioned in the Amazon Synod. 9. Obviously, a lot of work is needed on the financial reforms in the Vatican, but this should not be the most important criterion in the selection of the next pope. The Vatican has no substantial debts, but continuing annual deficits will eventually lead to bankruptcy. Obviously, steps will be taken to remedy this, to separate the Vatican from criminal accomplices and balance revenue and expenditure. The Vatican will need to demonstrate competence and integrity to attract substantial donations to help with this problem. Despite the improved financial procedures and greater clarity, continuing financial pressures represent a major challenge, but they are much less important than the spiritual and doctrinal threats facing the church, especially in the first world. Signed by the anonymous, probably Cardinal, probably Papa Bile Cardinal, calling himself Demos, Lent 2022. All right, look, I'm going to sound pretty cynical when I say this, but here it is. This memo reads more like a stump speech than it does a plea to the cardinals to make a better choice the next time around. It just sounds like something that was written by someone who is promising to be a more moderate pope and what they would write to his brother cardinals. Maybe I'm wrong, and I honestly hope I'm wrong about that, but that's what it sounds like to me. If when the See of Peter suddenly becomes vacant upon Francis's going to his particular judgment, we'll find out for sure. If someone comes forward and sounds suspiciously like that memo, then you'll know who wrote it. If someone comes out and takes credit for it at that time, we'll definitely know. Now, I'm pretty cynical about the next conclave because Francis has appointed something like two-thirds of those who are going to be participating in the conclave, including almost all of the younger Papa Bile candidates. Papa Bile meaning generally seen by their peers as being having the right stuff to be Pope. So, the outcome is much more likely to produce a Francis II than a Pius XIII. But of course, we can always pray and fast for a good outcome for the next conclave, and it is the season for praying and fasting. I'm going to sound cynical when I say this, especially after all that, everything I said about Fatima at the beginning, but here it is. That memo reads more like a stump speech than it does a plea to the cardinals to make a better decision in the next conclave than they made in the last few of them. It just sounds like something that was written by someone promising to be a more moderate pope than what we've had recently. Maybe I'm wrong. I honestly hope I'm wrong about that, but that's just what it sounds like to me. If when the Holy See suddenly becomes vacant upon Francis's going to his particular judgment, we'll find out for sure. If someone comes forward in the during that interregnum period, that set of a Kant period, and sounds suspiciously like that memo when they start giving public addresses, then you'll probably know who wrote it. If someone comes out and just claims that they wrote it, takes responsibility, we'll know for sure. I Now, I'm pretty cynical about the next conclave because Francis has chosen something like two-thirds of the next cardinals who are going to choose his successor. So I'm pretty skeptical about it. The chances are highly likely that we're going to get a Francis II and not a Pius XIII. 
But of course, we can always pray and fast for a good outcome for the next conclave, just like we should be praying and fasting for Francis to actually follow the instructions of heaven at this alleged coming consecration. Now, what did you think of all this? Am I off base in being cynical about the memo and about the Fatima thing? All of it. Part of my cynicism is that the recent popes were cited as examples of what the next pope should emulate when Francis' predecessors were responsible for setting the stage for our present mess, Fatima included. A better example of a good pope who will enact the needed reforms is a Pius X or a Leo XIII, both of whom cracked down on errors as they were showing themselves. But again, maybe I'm wrong. Let me know in the comments what you thought of all this, and like and subscribe if you haven't. It really does help. As always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.